All right, good morning. All right, we're gonna we're gonna have a good session on uh, ankle fractures to start off this morning. Um, we do have an all-star panel here. Um, Drew Brady is here from First State Orthopedics at Christiana. We have um, Matthew Craig from the Rothman Insti Institute working mainly out of Abington Hospital and Aria Torsdale. And then soon we will be joined by Susan Harding from Drexel University at Hahnemann. So I just wanna remind everyone about the learning objectives. Um, <clears throat> at the end of these sessions, you'll be able to understand the current trend in uh, fracture management. Uh, you'll, you'll improve your skills uh, with the management of periarticular fractures, and you'll recognize some controversies that are involved with the treatment of periarticular fractures. So we'll just go ahead and start our cases. Uh, case number one, 83 year old female, fell down two steps, complaining of ankle pain, closed injury, no skin at risk, no blisters, no neuro deficits. Uh, internal medicine and cardiology consulted. She is wrist stratted and optimized for the OR. And uh, she's gonna go with uh, the uh, star orthopedic physician. We have Dr. Harding. She's coming in hot. <laughs> All right. Good. All right. We have our initial radiographs here. Uh, Dr. Craig, can you please comment on the films? Uh, so we got uh, <clears throat> three views of the ankle, you know, AP lateral, mortis view. Um, Commonality to the medial side. The, Fibula appears to be intact, but looks on that lateral view all the way on the left, uh, a large posterior malar fracture with some subluxation posteriorly of the, uh, of the talus within the mortise. Okay. Tell me about your thought process, I guess. What, what's going through your mind as far as treatment <clears throat> algorithm here? Uh, well, so she's an, an older patient to kind of look at them and say, is this stable or unstable? You know, the stable fractures let them heal, no surgery, unstable fractures, we ought to fix it. I describe this as an unstable ankle fracture. She's dislocating posteriorly. We could debate whether we considered a, a pilon versus an ankle fracture. The joint is the ankle, but her low energy injury, it's more of a rotational mechanism, it's a, a bad ankle fracture. Um, for these, I do like to get CT scans pre-op to uh, understand them a little better. Okay, all right, Dr. Brady, anything to uh, add on that? Assessment? I agree with everything you said uh, so far. I think you, you need to have the debate, at least internally with yourself, on whether this is a pilon fracture or whether this is just a bad ankle fracture. Uh, because I would, you know, I look at this uh, and I look at this as more of a pilon fracture. And mm -hmm. I would think about what would go through my mind is the, uh, the cascade that we put in play when we see uh, bad pilon fractures, not just when we see just a run of the mill ankle fracture. Um, whether you operate on this initially or whether you stage it uh, is one thing, and we can certainly debate that, uh, but I think you have to think of it more as a pilon so you know what your expected outcomes are gonna be, uh, and you know that you may have to respect this fracture a little bit more than you would uh, just a run-of-the-mill ankle fracture. Dr. Hardy. Yeah. <laughs> I am coming in hot. All right. Um, I agree exactly with what the other guys have said, but I just wanted to offer up a suggestion. Um, when it's the middle of the night and you're trying to describe to your attending or your resident is trying to describe to you uh, what, uh, or the ER doc or whatever, is what you're looking, what they're looking at. I mean, in today's world, you just send pictures. I know it's very different, but we all have to be careful with that kind of texting and stuff. So I've taught my guys to call these injuries plafonds. Just to distinguish in our own minds the difference between a trimal and a pilon and that in-between area that we're all talking about. Because immediately, from the moment they call me and say, I have a bad plafond fracture, we already know amongst ourselves that that means it was a lower energy mechanism. It probably doesn't have a ton of axial impaction type patterns, but it's way worse than just your average ankle fracture. And then that puts everybody in the same place right from the beginning of the conversation. So it's just, you know, it's not written in a book or anything like that, but it helps. Well said. All right, um, we don't have any intermediate uh, imaging, but uh, we're going into the OR. 
Dr. Craig, tell me about your uh, uh, methodology of fixation here. Uh, I, I mean, I didn't do this surgery, but uh, so it looks like somebody's reduced the medial malleolus with uh, you know some temporary K wire fixation that with uh, right through the anterior, you know, into the anterior colliculus. You can see on the lateral and the AP, uh, and then our uh, uh, you know lateral view of the ankle with a. I guess we'll see an AP later. I hope uh, a medial base plate. But uh, it looks like there's nothing in the posterior malleolus. Okay, so so I guess we didn't we didn't really talk about that, but uh, <clears throat> maybe there was something that wasn't recognized initially on those uh, plane films that we saw before. You guys talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> uh, it wasn't recognized. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, at least, at least from what you're showing me here, it uh, you know here we are. All right. So <clears throat> we have immediate post-op films. Uh, Dr. Brady, can you uh, uh, comment on these x-rays? Uh, so, you know, as Dr. Craig said, there's medial-based medial fixation. Um, it looks like they tried to really uh, address that major medial malleolus fracture fragment that you could see on your initial films. Uh, if we go back to the K-wire uh, film, Mm -hmm. It looks like you've got a nice dome of your talus that uh, is nice and congruent uh, with, the, with the distal tibia. Um, so that's good uh, on that initial left-handed um, x-ray that's there. If you look at the, uh, the right-handed uh, x-ray, the lateral view uh, with the plate on, uh, you don't quite see that same contour. Uh, and then I think when you look at the, uh, the final uh, x-rays that you get you know, postoperatively, uh, you're missing that good tibiotalar contour. You're starting to see a little bit of that posterior malleola starting to creep up. If you follow a cortical line down, you can see uh, that you're a little short on that uh, posterior mouth segment. You can, you can get an idea that you may have a little bit of a mal reduction uh, on both of the uh, AP and lateral views. Okay. All right. So uh, we got a two-week follow-up here, and... Uh, Maybe things are not working out as planned. Dr. Harding, what would you say? <clears throat> well, um, even <coughs> this, is a, this is the classic, you know, perfect view that looks right down the barrel of your malreduction, which is always so frustrating if you don't have, if you didn't appreciate that in the OR, you know? And we've mm -hmm. all had that experience, no matter how far along you get, that still happens to you sometimes. Turn the so, yeah, <laughs> so you have two choices, right? You could do a better job or you could just take an extra post-op x-ray and somehow destroy the first one. Um, but again, if, you, if, if the conversation had been had early on, this is like a plafond injury, then a CAT scan, I think, would have helped a ton, mm -hmm. right? Um, to recognize the fragment and make a better surgical plan. At this point in time, um, uh, this patient, I, I think, I mean, it's already starting to drift, I, th I think. I, again, it might just be a, a different view of it, but it, I think it's starting to drift. And she's not congruent really on the lateral. You know, you could see the um, asymmetry in the anterior joint space compared to the posterior, you can see. So that's yeah. kind of flat there. It's not brought down all the way. Yeah. So her talus isn't really going to be contained. So if you decide to leave it like this, you're doing that for whatever reason that you've acknowledged it's not gonna be a good result. Maybe they're too sick to go back to the OR or whatever, mm -hmm. but you have to recognize the ultimate outcome with something like this. So if you can take them back, then you probably, sh and the skin is okay, and all of those factors come into play, then you probably should just bite the bullet and revise it. Okay, all right. So um, are we gonna get some advanced imaging now? Think that's necessary? I think advanced imaging is, is a definite, reasonable uh, next step to do. The question you have to put in your mind, though, um, is whether you want to do that advanced imaging before or after hardware is removed. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's going to be after hardware is removed, then you know you're at least staging this and you're putting this 83-year-old lady in for two operations rather than just one operation. Uh, but I think it's reasonable to know how much joint impaction you have uh, and just exactly where that, uh, that posterior malleolus is and what direction it's displaced. Okay. And another option, I mean, again, you know, you have to 
for each patient, you have to make your decision specific to that patient. And we're going to talk about that later today as well. But that's such an important take home because if she's 83, you could just say, let's let this heal. You have to be, f you know, full disclosure is really important. So you don't just say, oh, it looks great, you know, when you know it doesn't. But you discuss with them their options. And maybe the best option for this particular patient is to just let it heal. And if she gets really bad arthritis and needs a fusion, then that's only her second operation and it's definitive. And if she doesn't feel that much pain because, you know, elderly patients, their perception is often very different. All their joints kind of ache and their activities are very limited. So you could kind of just let this go and let it heal because it'll heal and then it'll be a malreduction and see how she does. Okay. That's surgical nihilism. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think that's a completely reasonable. Just amputate. Reasonable, It'd be fine. <laughs> a completely reasonable approach. Um, and you know, we all have patients who have less than perfect results, and they want no more operations because they're fine. They can yeah. deal with it. I, Put I'm them not in a brace and keep going. Absolutely. I'm not saying you talk down to her and you just tap her, pat her on the head and say, "You'll be okay, dear." You know, I'm not saying that. But if you have a full conversation with her and she says, "You know what? I understand the pros and the cons, the risks, the benefits. My choices are laid out clearly on the table." And I would like to just see how it does and then deal with it. If it doesn't do well, I don't think that's unreasonable for this patient. Now, if she's 18, obviously your conversation is going to be very different. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, it's, it's unstable, so you were able to, in the operating room to obtain a reduction, but there was, there was not any fixation to maintain the reduction. And that's not addressed with a medial plate. I suppose you could if she was maintaining a cast, um, you know, dorsiflexed for life until it was healed. I would think that's, that's a reasonable thing to think of, uh, and I think that goes through my thought process, at least when the posterior mouth fragments are a little bit smaller than this. This appears to be about 50% uh, of the width of the joint uh, on the lateral, although, I mean, that's, you know, we can turn the x-ray to make it bigger or smaller. But, you know, if it's in the, the realm of 25% or so, I think a lot of times I'll, you know, fix the majority of the fracture, um, dorsiflex them, because I don't think it's necessarily worth it to go posterior to do a, uh, a big open approach posteriorly, uh, and then make sure you keep a maximum dorsiflex until you get to see some healing at the joint. Okay. So we do have some uh, advanced imaging here, and I can't take credit for this. Dr. Craig made this possible. I have no idea so. how to do that. <clears throat> kind of have you, some the, the secret is, uh, my kids taught me, you just <laughs> scroll through the CT scan and then take a video with your iPhone. <laughs> That's all you do. And then it imports no. a whole lot easier and actually works in the talk. How many talks have you been to? They, videos don't work. I did that. I'm like, oh, it's great. And, and that's how you can send them from person to person if you want a second opinion, too. Yeah, this, actually, when I say I, send me a CAT scan, people are always like, ugh, on the other end of the phone. And I'm like, no, 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 just videotape it. Yeah, you just, it's eight, an eight second video. So, and you can play it back and forth, back and forth. Cool. Can Chris will play again on the, on the left side, the left oh. one? Sure. So tips and tricks, not only for fixation, but also <laughs> communication. Yeah. So the, also the, important. The, 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 all, the, all, the, all the young people out there are like, oh my God, these people are so old. I, yeah. So uh, yeah, the, the disclaimer, this is the, the case that I'd submitted. It's, uh, I submitted. It's not my uh, surgical responsibility up to this point. But uh, she's in a cast, so somebody, it's, she's not really dorsiflex. So somebody suggested, what about dorsiflex? And so the guy who sent her to me said, oh, I'm going to put you in a cast, and uh, I don't know what to do. Go see Craig. Um, but the medial-based fixation, I used medial-based fixation. I'm not bashing medial-based fixation, but for a dominantly posterior uh, fracture, using medial-based fixation is not the you know, answer, not the direction you ought to be heading here. Uh, and then the, the entire workup did not include a uh, CT scan preoperatively to appreciate what was going on. So here we are with this. So now what? Okay. So I, I know what I'm going to do, but how about the panel? Okay. Dr. Brady, what do you think? Uh, well, it looks like the uh, medial-based uh, screws are going right through your fracture, so it's not going to reduce on its own, uh, mm -hmm. even if you maximally dorsiflex it at this point. You may get the joint a little bit more congruent, but you're always going to have that gap there. Mm -hmm. I, I think it goes back to, you know, she's 83. If she's 
25, the answer I think is uh, easier. Uh, mm -hmm. And that answer is going to be, we're going to take the hardware off. Um, I might stage it with an external fixer just to try to pull it out to length a little bit. Uh, and then most likely uh, go back in and try to address the dominant fracture fragment, which is that posterior piece, uh, most likely posteriorly. Okay. Dr. Harding? Well, I've actually seen this case before, and I know what Matt did is outstanding, <laughs> so we should just cut to the truth. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, Drew, if you were... 20 something I think I think she would tolerate an x-fix um, not to be, be an ageist but yeah 80 my, my approach for an 83 year old eh, let's let's you know do good work let's go in do do one surgery I like the idea of staging it um, the younger people tend to come to you later mm -hmm. they're gonna come to you six weeks later not two weeks later she's and she's healing slower because she's eight, older I, I don't know I think you can get a get the reduction with one stage versus two stage but I like the idea of staging it if necessary Younger people will tolerate it better, that's my opinion. Sometimes staging it lets yeah. you get to think about it a little bit longer. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Need time to ponder. Okay. I understand. What do you got here, Dr. Craig? Uh, so uh, I like this also because it's almost ex almost exactly the same thing we saw at the beginning of the case. So yeah, so to reduce, so it went prone, uh, flex the knee up or go medial, take out the old hardware, <laughs> then posterior lateral approach. Still reducing the medial mal, still putting that pin in the medial mal, making a congruent joint on the uh, AP view, then from the lateral view with the posterior approach, reducing the posterior middle fracture, um, some interfrag screws uh, across that. Um, and there's also, you know, you can see a clamp on that, that medial side going from ADP, um, but then also a posterior base fixation for buttress plate and reduction. Okay. Do you have a question, sir? Yes, sir. <coughs> Yes. So the dorsal flexion is to reduce it. It's just it's too big for that. Sometimes in the splits, if you set a little better flexion, it helps pull it down. Mm -hmm. But within the OR, reduce the first time the patient's you know paralyzed. So there's no multiple pull across that, and it's reduced. But it's never had direct fixation on the fracture. So as soon as the paralysis is gone, the gas starts pulling, then it pulls back up. If you turn the film off. comments. So we have our uh, final intraoperative uh, imaging. Um, anything to add about the fixation strategy from the panel? Looks no. great. Where'd you get that medial plate from? Uh, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what, what, what exactly is that, Dr. Craig? What, how did you make that medially uh, based So plate? it's a, a one, uh, I guess it's a locking one third semitubular plate. Uh, that I cut the um, last hole to make a little bit of a hook. Uh, and is that FDA approved or not? I'm not really sure. But uh, that, and then contour it for the medial side. It's yeah. So I, I, I believe that it is not uh, yeah, sorry. on label. Just however, right however, <laughs> it, the, the, if, you're, if you're looking for this in literature, it would be called a spring plate. So um, something to look out for. Any other comments, Dr. Harding? Yeah. I think, I think she's got a lot better prognosis now, so. Okay. How is her skin and stuff? That's it's fine. That. Yeah, she's good. okay. All right, and we got our six-month weight-bearing x-rays here. Doing pretty well here. Yeah, she walked out. Okay. She's quite happy, pain-free. So, um, yeah, get weight-bearing x-rays. I see lots of people showing their ankle stuff. I know that we have our ankle expert coming to the mic. Um, weight-bearing weight your ankle. If, they're weight, if they walk into the office, I get weight-bearing x-rays. Okay. All right. Any comments on that? 
Dr. Harding? Oh, I was, no, I was just going to mention about you know, the fixation. Uh, we, uh, those spring plates that you make or, or you can get them already made, they're great for the right indications. You just have to be careful of the soft tissues there. That can yeah. be a little bit problematic in some patients, especially if they just have a really prominent malleolus. Yeah, it's always good to remember that the medial side is uh, always tenuous subcutaneous bone. And so from a fixation standpoint, the posterior plate addresses the large posterior malleolar fragment. Uh, medial fixation is really a buttress against varus collapse, and there was also a bunch of holes there uh, that I wanted to address. So I, that I absolutely needed to do it. Um, you could use that words of you could get away without it, but I didn't do it at this point. We're not trying to get away with something. I want it fixed. Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to go to uh, audience response question. So we're going to talk about fixation method of the posterior malleolus. So how do you fix your posterior malleolar fractures? Do you use anterior to posterior screws, posterior to anterior screws, or do you use a buttress plate? We'll see what the audience wants to do. <clears throat> Okay, so kind of got an even split, uh, more with anterior to posterior screws and then quite a few people doing uh, direct buttress plating. So uh, Dr. Craig, what would you say your, uh, I, I mean, I guess we'll, we'll know the answer to this question, but what is your preferred method of fixation of posterior malleolar fractures? So uh, if they're big enough to fix, I think they're big enough to fix. So it'd be a direct reduction, so it'd be um, P to A. So um, to pair articular fracture, clean it, clamp it, screw it, plate it. So I would you know, reduce the fracture, a posterior to anterior uh, screw, and then usually then a buttress plate. I sometimes have just put a buttress plate. So my, I didn't have a clicker. So I'd either be answering B or C here. I think you have some, there's some literature out there to suggest that really P, posterior fixation for the posterior malleolus is superior. Okay. Dr. Brady? Uh, posterior to anterior screws, I think, are biomechanically stronger um, than anterior to posterior screws. Uh, and as much as you want to scrutinize your x-ray um, and, and know where that fracture is or get CT scans, there's a fairly high likelihood that you're going to miss your posterior screw if you go anterior to posterior, or you're going to miss the, uh, the fragment if you go anterior to posterior. You're not going to get as good a fixation as you think you're going to get. Um, and this is a basically a partial articular fracture, and you know our AO training tells us that partial articular B type fractures need B for a buttress plate. Dr. Harding. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with everything that everybody said already. I mean, I have been known to occasionally put an A to P screw across, but there has to be a, like a really good reason for it, like super bad skin in the back, or which you don't see as much, but you can see, or just a patient that's, again, older and you're just trying to get him off the table quickly. Um, if you have to go to the back, I really think that a buttress plate is a, a, a superior construct. If it's a big enough piece and you're worried enough about it, then I'd go with the plating before I do a P to A screw. Okay. So uh, maybe sometimes those um, tibial shaft fractures, you'll see a catch it on the lateral view or somebody happened to get a CT scan with a tibial shaft fracture, you're going to nail, and then, oh my gosh, look, there's a posterior malleolus fracture. Non-displaced, completely anatomically reduced, can barely see it on the, on the x-ray. I'll do um, A to P screws, but the posterior malleolus is a lateral structure, right? So you'll see these front to back screws, and the more medial one didn't catch anything. So you got, when you do it, you really just have to hug the syndesmosis to make sure you get very lateral with your, with your A to P screw. Okay. All right. So we have some uh, summary slides of some of the literature that maybe, uh, sorry, that supports things. Uh, sorry about that. So this is a, <clears throat> uh, a study um, talking about the orientation of fracture lines in these uh, posterior malleolar uh, injuries and that, uh, you know, there's usually a continuous spectrum of posterior lateral oriented fracture lines that you have to really understand on the uh, CT scans. Um, and you can also have uh, quite a bit of medial extension with these injuries um, in the type two uh, fracture pattern, and that, that deserves some uh, separate uh, recognition. 
And this, these are some pictures from this uh, study that kind of uh, demonstrate the three types of posterior malleolar fractures. Um, and the type two is in the middle in which you have uh, uh, extreme medial extension uh, with some fragmentation uh, in which the uh, posterior colliculus of the medial malleolus is involved. So it, it uh, uh, disrupts um, uh, deltoid um, integrity. Uh, through an avulsion mechanism. So um, that fragment may um, deserve some independent or fragment-specific fixation. Um, also, there's some literature to support <coughs> uh, the use of uh, buttress plating with these injuries as it's been found to be superior. Um, and this is a, a paper that discusses the uh, fragment-specific fixation of that uh, posterior medial aspect of the distal tibia in which you may have to do a posterior medial approach and work around the neurovascular bundle. Um, you can see those fragments from the lateral side, but instrumenting them is quite difficult from the posterior lateral aspect of the tibia, so a posterior medial approach uh, is usually warranted. <coughs> So take home points from this case. Um, you have to uh, make the correct diagnosis. There was some discussion about um, whether this was a uh, ankle fracture or pilon fracture. So knowing the difference is really important. Um, getting adequate films uh, and um, uh, advanced imaging is probably warranted in these uh, injuries so you can properly identify your fracture line orientation. Um, and then uh, definitely choose the correct surgical approach uh, to get to the fracture and fix it adequately. Know your implants, and I have a quote from Dr. Craig, clean it, clamp it, screw it, and plate it. And I think he's referring to the posterior malleolus <laughs> fracture or any type of intraarticular fracture. Uh, you want anatomic reduction and absolute stability for those. All right, moving on to case two. We have a 19-year-old fall off of a BMX bike. Uh, right ankle deformity, reduced and splinted in the emergency department, complaining of medial ankle pain, and he has a nickel allergy. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Brady. Wow. That looks Any bad. thoughts? Uh, for first, I want to know if it was open or not. Um, and oh. The initial thing uh, to note is that you see you have an uh, ankle fracture dislocation, posterior subluxation of the talus with respect to the distal tibia and some apex anterior deformity uh, of the fibula with a large spike. Um, and the fibular fracture, I'd say, is about five or six centimeters or so, probably uh, superior uh, to the tibial plafond. So you're, you're concerned for some ligamentous injury as well. However, before we do anything, this just needs to be reduced. OK. Any comments from Dr. Harding or Dr. Craig? Uh, no. Get Get it reduced, get some better reduction x-rays, and I mean, the syndesmosis is widened as well. Mm -hmm. I, know. I, I like looking at injury films, too. When I get presented with splint films, so like I look <coughs> x-rays out of the splint or these, because this tells me what's, you know, this is unstable. This would benefit from surgery. Yeah. I always tell the residents, injury films are hugely important. They tend to focus mostly on their post-reduction. <clears throat> but when you're making your operative planning, um, the injury films really tell you a lot about the deforming event, you know, and the forces that were at work and what, and what some of the deficiencies are because I don't know if you guys have had this experience, but I've had um, ankle fracture dislocations that in the, in the operating room, even with all of the different little tests that we do, um, I was kind of in that in-between zone about the syndesmosis and what, how it was. And if you look back at the original injury before the reduction, Sometimes that can weigh in as your final vote, you know, and it usually tends towards fixing it, you know, stabilizing it. So I always tell the residents, because they'll be like, I'm not sure if this has a syndesmotic injury, and they're looking at the splinted image, and I'm like, look at that. that there's no question, you know. Uh, so they forget that part. So that's important. I agree 100% with that. All right. See, that doesn't look like you could say, I'm not really sure, but don't forget to look at how it appeared when it first came through your door. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, going to ask you, Dr. Brady, who does this reduction for you uh, at your institution? The emergency department. They do a good job? Yeah. Or how often are you coming in or your PA coming in to, I know his practice. <laughs> um, 
very rarely. Um, there are times um, I had a case where, you know, I put up my commentary about how annoyed I was with the emergency department because they made me come in to just reduce an ankle fracture, but it was truly unstable. Um, we're, we're actually in a good uh, position and situation where our emergency department is very good um, at getting reductions of ankle fracture dislocations. Um, sometimes you may have a little bit of uh, discrepancy on the splinting that's used, um, but the, the actual getting a reduction and get it, getting that reduction to stay, they're really good at it. So maybe once or twice a year do I have to come in to do it. Okay. All right. So what about treatment plan for this? What do we have to consider, Dr. Harding? Um, can I see the pre-reduction again for a second? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we've already touched on the fact that you need to be conscientious about your soft tissue um, envelope. So, you know, a high energy injury like this, even though it's not open, may require a period of cooling off, even external fixation if necessary. Um, you know, that's certainly an important thing and monitoring their neurovascular status and their compartments and everything like that. But beyond that, when you're just moving on to the fixation parameters, I would definitely want to get it. I mean, I'm not really sure. I can't see as well from here, and I have old people eyes now, but is that, is there anything going on with the medial malleolus there? I can't really tell exactly. Um, I, it doesn't look I like don't it. think so. My eyes are only slightly younger than yours, but I can't tell I'm closer. <laughs> and then the, the, could you go to the, the Reduction film again. Mm -hmm. I I mean, it looks like there's some sort of little something there, but if it's that small, we can't see it. Yeah, right. Okay. We're good. So, um, even though, so, so I guess it looks like it's kind of like uh, Mace New variant, not quite as high as you know you might traditionally call Mace New, but certainly you know high fibular Weber C with uh, synosmotic disruption, and I tend to get a CAT scan on these. Okay. I why, caught, why is that? I got caught once or twice with debris in the joint that I didn't recognize on the plane film. And it affected my ability to achieve an accurate reduction, and I only realized that after I wasn't satisfied and had to end up taking them for a CAT scan post-fixation, which okay. is not the way you want to do it, obviously, because then you're stuck with the decision about revising it. And sometimes it's not a free fragment that would be markedly evident. Sometimes it's just like a pulling off of some of the cortical edge, you know, that just gets kind of a little bit malrotated or stuffed in the wrong spot. And so even though it looks like it's trying to reduce itself here, or clearly the talus is not concentrically reduced underneath uh, the um, ankle, I mean the, um, uh, the distal tibial um, articular surface. So. With that disruption in the mortise, I think that I would just want to be sure. Okay. So you're talking about maybe subtle avulsions that you see on the plane films. Nothing, nothing about the fracture pattern itself would, would push you to get a CT scan. It's just these subtleties that you see. Well, just the fact that with these high, high energy um, Mace Nuve type injuries, yeah. Okay. Any other comments from uh, Dr. Brady or Dr. Craig? Uh, I think the uh, CT scan may be helpful uh, to evaluate the syndesmosis. Um, however, you know it's going to be off at this point just because there's some shortening through the fibula and you don't have a congruent ankle mortise at this point. Um, I haven't traditionally gotten CT scans for this type of injury, but I, I can see how it could be helpful. Yeah, you're not really getting the CAT scan to decide whether the syndesmosis needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. you, I'm getting it to make sure that there's mm -hmm. nothing that's going to prevent me from fixing it accurately at, when I get in there, you know? Because I don't know, I mean, I'm not, are you opening all of yours? No. We'll get into that. Okay. <laughs> um, so in so, so fix, fixation strategy, Dr. Craig, what would you think? Uh, so we know we have to get a congruent ankle joint, and we're thinking that given this is a high fibular fracture that there's going to be a significant syndesmotic injury uh, associated with this. Uh, so I'm deciding how I'm going to fix that syndesmosis and whether it's going to include fibular fixation or not. Um, you know, if a guy came in and got hit with a baseball bat and had this type of fibular fracture, I would say, eh, we can leave that alone and let that heal on its own um, and not necessarily have to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, if a guy came in without the fibular fracture and just had twisted his ankle and had a syndesmotic injury, then we would 
fixate low to, to the ankle uh, and fixed to syndesmosis. So you've got sort of a combination of those two. Um, so in my mind, I'm thinking whether I need to put a long plate on fixed to fibula as well as to syndesmosis, uh, which I would probably tend to do because I think that's going to help to reestablish the length mm -hmm. of your fibula so that you can put your syndesmosis um, back to where it's supposed to be. And I have to admit that I'm not really good at knowing if I've got a truly reduced syndesmosis at this point or not. Okay. Yep. Dr. Harding, what yeah. do you think? These are the hardest things in the world to fix correctly. I mean, we, there's lots of literature like Tampa and stuff that talks about that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how inaccurate we are in our reduction of our syndesmotic injuries. Yeah. Um, you know, they did CAT scans after the fact and just showed how bad a job we were really doing. And that's a huge thing for a young person because the ankle is a ring, just like the pelvis is a ring. And if that ring is not accurate, then you're going to end up with significant post-traumatic DJD. So, you know, again, stuff like debris in the joint that, you, that either goes unrecognized or underrecognized, and getting the fibula out to length accurately and accurately rotated as well mm -hmm. um, is so critical. So I would absolutely fix this fibula. Okay. And, and fixing the fibula is not easy. It's a knife edge of bone uh, at that level. Um, so yep. be prepared to struggle. Yep. And but if it's a little higher, it's even harder because you start to get into dangerous territory. Mm -hmm. and, okay. You know. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you could do it. You just have to be careful. So when's the threshold? Like, what height do you just say, oh, we can leave the fibula alone? Like one height in the, in <laughs> yeah, the leg? I don't know. I don't think it's, height, I don't think it's a height decision. Okay. Higher, higher than that. <laughs> yeah, and Sean Nork is fixing like all the way up, you know, I mean, he's, he, they're very aggressive, you know. Okay. Uh, and, and, and I've become more aggressive over the years, too. I, I wouldn't, I mean, I don't fix all my fibulas by any means, but yeah. some people are advocating that. So, so you're just saying that it's just important that the fibula is out to length. Whatever you got to do to get Everything. that fibula out to and length, rotational. that's important. And rotation. And rotation. Which is not easy. Okay. So here is what was done. Dr. Brady, commenting on fixation strategy. Uh, so uh, long fibular plate uh, to bypass the fibular fracture. Doesn't look like any lag screws were used uh, inside the fracture itself, but it looks like the length was uh, relatively uh, reestablished okay. Um, and then we've got a suture button fixation uh, holding the syndesmotic reduction. Okay. Um, so, reasonable option. I'm sorry, sir? I said reasonable option. Okay. All right. So I guess we, got, we, we have a lot of points of uh, discussion around this, and uh, I think one is how to reduce the syndesmosis. So I want to ask the audience what their preferred method of uh, reducing the syndesmosis so we have clamp with fluoroscopy, excuse me, fluoroscopy, uh, clamp under direct visualization, digital pressure with fluoroscopy, and digital pressure under uh, direct visualization. You need, you need music. Yeah. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Maybe ding, next year. Ding, ding, ding. Think about that. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, half of the participants saying clamp with fluoroscopy, um, and uh, we have about, I guess, 24% of people using digital pressure with direct open reduction versus a fluoroscopic uh, judgment, and then about 22% using the clamp under direct visualization. So, Dr. Craig, what do you think? Preferred method of syndesmotic reduction? Uh, I mean, if you're good at what you do, you can get you know, the end result, what it needs to be, I think that's fine. Um, if you're really strong, I guess you could push really hard. If you're open and pushed on it and see it's reduced and then the screw is probably, well, whatever device you're using, screw. We'll get into whatever, that too. Yeah, um, <laughs> is probably going to uh, over compress past what you could do with your finger. Um, I, I mean, I, I, my uh, disclaimer, I, I've answered B because I do, I tend to be open and look at it and just put a clamp across the tibia, the fibula, but I've also done A as well. Um, I also like clamps because they're like a third hand, so mm -hmm. like even if I'm pushing on it, then what else can I do? So I, that's why C and D didn't really like so much. Okay. Dr. Brady? So, so, you know, the traditional way to do it is to put the big uh, C 
kind of clamp tongs yeah. on it. And the biggest one you can Maximal find. dorsiflexion and squeeze it until you can't squeeze it anymore. Um, and then there's some studies that show, well, you can't really over-reduce the syndesmosis, so it's okay for us doing that. However, mm -hmm. I think um, more folks are starting to, to move towards digital uh, reduction uh, and mm -hmm. sort of let the syndesmosis kind of find its own home as long as your fibula is out to length. And I've started to move in that realm a little bit more. Um, so uh, occasionally I still will clamp it, um, particularly if I'm worried about it and I want to see a good x-ray of it. Mm -hmm. Um, before I do, because you know you technically probably shouldn't do digital pressure and then take an X-ray. Uh, we take enough enough X-rays all day that we don't want to burn our skin or you know increase our cancer risk. Um, so I'm somewhere between A and D. Okay. All right, Dr. Harding. I mean, this is like a wimpy answer, but I've done I do all of those <laughs> different times. Um, I think everybody needs to be conscientious about the fact that. The, the concept of clamping the synosmosis has come under um, attack because it's not so much that we can over-reduce it, which I think they, we don't think that anymore, but that you can mal-reduce it by, like, again, especially rotationally. Rotate it up. Yeah, but like if your clamp prongs are not exactly right, which it's very hard to estimate, you know, with the mind's eye where that should be, um, then you can, uh, then that can be problematic. So you know, aggressive clamping, forcing the thing into a position that maybe it doesn't want to assume mm -hmm. it may be counterproductive. So I do a lot of now digital pressure with fluoroscopy. I occasionally will open it under, and look at it under direct visualization if I feel that it's a little bit more complex, it's not reducing well, it, there's the question of debris, um, you know, something on that CAT scan that I got says to me that this could be problematic, but I don't open all of them because I think, I don't know, if in my hands at least, it's a lot more soft tissue dissection, and I'm concerned about that too. Okay, all right. Can we go to the next uh, question? Yeah, we'll just hit that. So, syndesmotic fixation method. So, we'll have a question about that. So, um, what type of fixation do you use for the syndesmosis? Is it screws? Is it a suture button? Um, no, is that for this patient or just? In no, general? in general, in general. Uh, or is it a hybrid between the two? I guess I could have put something else as well. So what happened? We're Maybe done. two people, <laughs> three. Okay. Yeah, let's re <laughs> Interesting. I want to know. Okay. I think we can start. Yeah, we can start the counter. People are ready. Okay. All right. So 60% are using screw fixation, about a third are using a suture button, and then a small percentage of uh, patient. Uh, uh, excuse me, physicians are using uh, a hybrid fixation. So what do you guys think, Dr. Harding? About? Which type and why? Yeah, no, I no, about oh. 10 years ago. I'm, I'm telling a story. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. About 10 years ago, I gave a talk at POS about syndesmotic fixation, and I, um, like, blasted tight ropes and just said they were, it was, like, heretic, you know, medicine and, yeah. You know, all kinds of nasty comments, and now that is primarily what I use. Okay. And I like it, and I think it's better. I, in, from, in my hands, at least, for my patients, I always took out my screws. Mm -hmm. I always took out my screws because there's just, it makes sense to me, just gestalt-wise, that the mechanics of the ankle joint, that is a joint, and that's supposed to move. And it may not move a lot, but it, it, it the patients always felt better. And I can't really say for sure that they didn't just feel better because more time had gone by, mm -hmm. you know. But they would say, it feels more like my old ankle. They, it's not like they got more range of motion by degrees measurement and stuff like that, but they just felt more comfortable. And so I never made it mandatory, of course, but I offered it to them. And I didn't promise them any improvements, but I suggested to them that s a certain number of patients do feel more comfortable after it's out. So. I was doing that routinely, and then I 
started to incorporate the um, suture, button. suture and, and now I don't have to take that out and I think patients feel more comfortable with it. Again, in my opinion, level five evidence for the same reasons. Okay. Dr. Brady? Um, I, I was similar with the blasting the suture buttons the first time I ever saw it because you know you, you always see the disasters and new technology in your OR people doing this. Um, I think I'm more of a hybrid fixation, not on the same patient, but sort of depending upon the patient. Um, and if you're younger and more active, um, I am worried about over-reducing your syndesmosis and sort of causing you to have more ankle dysfunction uh, than if you're maybe older and have less good bone uh, or, you know, a joint that's been used for several years already. So generally in my younger patients, I'll do a suture button fixation. Mm -hmm. um, and in my older patients um, where I really want to get good solid fixation and I'm not as worried about um, the ankle, well, I don't want to say I'm not worried about ankle mechanics, but um, I, I tend to use a uh, screw uh, for that. Uh, and also the you know, the, the, doing a screw, is, it's just cheap, it's easy, it's in every set. You don't have to open up a separate set to do it. Uh, it's in every hospital or surgery center that I go to. Um, just having a regular small frag set and you can fix it. Okay, Dr. Craig? Um, my technique, I don't do the hybrid technique, but I'm probably 60-40, 60 40. 60 percent screws, 40 percent suture button. The older patients have been to use screws, younger patients, um, uh, the suture button. People. What's the word? What's the what's the concern with well, the older patient with the? Uh, I want more rigidity. Um, you know, grandma doesn't really complain about stiffness so much. If they don't really go down steps, they don't really complain about a lack of dorsiflexion. If they live in a level environment mm -hmm. and they had a walker to begin with, they really don't really complain about that loss of dorsiflexion. But if you're 24 and you can't have a hard time going down steps, that will be a problem for a long time. Okay. So. Uh, I'd put the screws in and leave them in and not take them out. Uh, if they really want them out, I'll take them out. But I kind of counsel them, give it four or five months, see how you do, and probably about 10% want them out. The, the suture button in um, younger patients. So some of the early literature came out from Minnesota where I trained, and they're nice people. They're hardworking people, looked at it thoughtfully, and some said that the outcomes were better with suture buttons. So it was a, a, a trend. It's taken a while, 10 years, these guys. Um, and so I use it in the minority of time, but I'll use it. Okay. Um, and then we have one more audience response question to talk about uh, when do you initiate weight bearing with patients who have syndesmotic injuries? So we're seeing a lot of literature being published about immediate weight bearing with ankle fractures, but not so sure if we're including those patients who have syndesmotic fixation. So when do we weight bear these patients? Okay, so about half doing it at six weeks. Um, have four percent doing immediate weight bearing. I'm just curious uh, if that's dependent upon the type of implant you use. Um, and then uh, about a quarter of uh, participants doing it at three months. So, uh, panelists, Dr. Craig, when do you weight bear? Uh, your syndesmotic injuries, and is it dependent upon implant types? Uh, I answered uh, eight to nine weeks because I, I begin progressive weight bearing in six weeks, so I thought, well, they're full weight bearing my eight to nine weeks. So I, I guess I answered the question. I initiate my weight bearing, but they're probably not full weight bearing for eight to nine weeks. Um, it used to be 12 weeks, and then I started backing it up, and everything was okay. Um, so for the 25% out there, start doing it earlier and see how you do. Um, you may find there's some dogma out there, you must do it this way, because we've always done it this way, and don't change it. Um, there's research now going, if you wait for it sooner, patients also figure it out. They'll walk in at six weeks, and I told them not to do that, but they did it anyway, and everything was fine. So you start to ask myself, maybe I'm wrong, right? You, you've been told, taught one way, and then you're seeing something different. Doesn't mean what they're doing is wrong, maybe you're wrong, kind of look at the perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, but you'll have one case fall apart and have to redo it, and then you realize <laughs> that something's wrong. Dr. Uh, Harding. Um, I also start around six weeks with some partial weight bearing, and by okay. eight weeks, let them go. Okay. And Dr. Brady? I say six weeks with syndesmosis, um, weight bearers tolerated. Okay. I don't think people tolerate eight to 12 weeks with articular fractures. You know, if you have a plateau or a pilon, you'll tell people you're going to go 12 weeks no matter what, and then mm -hmm. at eight weeks, they walk in. 
Yeah. Um, so they generally don't tolerate going longer than about six weeks. Okay. Um, I'm very nervous about immediate weight bearing on uh, these ligamentous injuries, um, and probably just because I don't understand them very well, and I'm not sure if I'm fixing them adequately enough. So we just need to tincture a time to give it a chance to heal before I'm going to let these people weight bear on it immediately, particularly if I've got just a, a suture button construct, because I don't know how much axial stability that's going to give you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I typically hold my patients to 12 weeks, but uh, like everyone, I have patients on just go mode. So I've had some uh, patients come in two weeks post-op with uh, suture button fixation, doing okay, weight bearing <laughs> immediately. So maybe we should just gather those people up and put them in a retrospective review and see what happens. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we can go back to the regular slides, please. So we talked about weight bearing. Um, and I just want to talk about some literature that deals with these uh, topics. So this, this is actually, uh, was just published ahead of print and um, uh, JOT. And this is a cadaveric study that just kind of looked at using CT scans to define something called the transcendismotic axis. And this is basically trying to define the appropriate trajectory to place your clamp. And what they found was <clears throat> that, um, it, of course, it's patient specific. Um, and if you place that medial tine 10 degrees anterior or 20 degrees posterior to that, to that TSA line, um, you have an increased risk of malreduction. And then uh, there is a concern for overcompression now. So I've, I've seen a couple articles about uh, the question specifically, can you overcompress a anatomically reduced syndesmosis? And apparently you can, even if you get the clamp trajectory appropriately placed. And they also found that digital reduction was the most reliable method of reduction. So this is a new paper, really interesting. Um, so another thing that I found that was really interesting is that they, this is a cadaveric study looking at the um, stability of the suture button versus screw. And what they did was is they, they compared uh, the rigidity of the two implants to a native syndesmotic ligament complex and found that the screw was too rigid and the suture button was too weak. So neither device is uh, matching the anatomic strength in the sagittal plane of the syndesmotic complex. Now this is a cadaveric study. So we can move on to the clinical uh, outcomes of this type of fixation. And this is the best study I could find, which was actually a meta-analysis of everything that's out there. Um, and these are kind of the uh, data points that they found. And they found that the AOFAS scores were better in the suture button group, higher uh, failure rate in the screw uh, group, malreduction rate was higher in the screw group. Range of motion uh, did not differ between implants, surprisingly. Shorter time to weight bearing suture button. Now there were three studies that looked at that and typically the difference was between six or eight weeks or eight and nine weeks. So not a big difference between the two groups but the suture button was favored in that uh, cohort of studies. And then of course there's a higher reoperation rate with screws. Uh, hardware removal was the most common surgery performed. All right. So take home points uh, for this uh, case are restoring fibular length is important in treating syndesmotic injuries, fibular length and rotation as Dr. Harding said, uh, malreduction of the syndesmosis or excuse me, manual reduction of the syndesmosis is the most reliable method um, and suture, suture button fixation appears to be uh, uh, superior to screw fixation uh, and may lead to earlier weight bearing. Okay, I think we have time for one more case. Uh, this is an 89-year-old male, lives independently, community <coughs> ambulator with a cane, status post fall on uneven sidewalk, uh, twisting of the left ankle, and it's an isolated injury. <coughs> um, on exam, palpable pulses, no open wounds, uh, but the skin is just paper thin. Uh, some mild uh, venous stasis changes. Uh, skin is at risk over the uh, distal medial aspect of the tibia. Uh, that's commonly found. Um, and uh, uh, the patient was reduced in the emergency department. Unfortunately, the um, uh, 
pre-reduction films were not available. Well, there actually weren't any. They saw the deformity. Oh, just went ahead and... And they just reduced it. Oh, just go, man. Yeah, just go oh. for it, man. Like, oh. I, I, I mean, that, you know, happens sometimes. <laughs> I don't know. Like, they won't reduce anything in, in my department, you know, in my hospital, and then suddenly, for some reason, some cowboy gets the idea to just do it before they take any x-rays. It's you know? gusto. Yeah. <laughs> gusto. Okay, <laughs> comment on this, uh, Dr. Hardy? Um, well, yeah, this is my case. So, I, I, I wish I had pictures of his skin, because you can't... This is a classic case of an, a very elderly patient with very poor skin that predates the injury. So it's not just, it's not the same problem as a young person with bad skin from an injury. Because those patients demand like that period of recovery that we all respect and wait for, either you know, in an X-Fix or whatever it needs, until their skin is better and you can do the more, you know, <coughs> Um, aggressive internal fixation that they all deserve. But this is skin that's never going to get better. It's really bad now, but it's only going to get to somewhat bad at its best, you know? And so for these injuries, and this was an unstable fracture. Uh, as soon as he came out of the splint, he immediately displaced. You can see the fibula's relatively high. Um, it's not just a little, you know, Weber A or something that you could put in a cast and let it go. Plus, a lot of these patients with bad skin do very poorly with mm -hmm. casts, so we had to consider other options. Okay, all right, Dr. Brady? Uh, I think in an 89-year-old, um, you'd like to think that cast treatment would be a reasonable option, um, but with you know, at-risk skin, I'm concerned you take your cast off at two weeks, even if you're checking it all the time, you're gonna see uh, bone or a big blister or something that you don't wanna see, so I don't think casting is Correct. I think it's going to need to be some form of either splinting that you can look at all the time, but he's unstable, so it's most likely operative treatment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes you try to get away with you don't you know, never want to do that say that term, but sometimes you try to get away with non-operative treatment of a bimal on a, an older person, um, but this doesn't sound like the person you want to do that. I'd either you know suck it up and do meticulous surgical technique bimal fixation uh, or consider. You know, maybe even some percutaneous fixation, accepting a medial mal mal reduction with mm -hmm. an external fixator. Okay, Dr. Craig. It, it, <coughs> injury sounds unstable based on the uh, the history, and it's a uh, unstable by mal. Um, I try not to practice ageism. I mean, if they're 79, 89, or 99, but they're out walking on the sidewalk, that's sort of enough for me to say this is somebody worthy of fixation. Um, but you, you know, I'm getting a clue as I, I try to not to stare. At, I'll stare at the fracture and then I'll look at everything else. You can see all those little clips where they took the saphenous vein. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so there's some venous stasis issues there to begin with. Uh, okay, so awesome. fixation and strategy. <laughs> and fixation strategy. Uh, I guess I'd, I'd get a handle on the skin. You could, uh, I would routinely just say, all right, we're going to plate the lateral side with a lateral base plate, locking plate, distal fibula fixation, and then the medial sided. Uh, I tend to plate the medial malleolus with a little thing I like to do, or some screws. Um, or if you say, look, the skin's bad uh, medially, let's just leave the medial malleolus alone. That's okay. It might supplement with syndesmonic fixation. Or if they tolerate, go prone, and the, the sort of the skin, if you will, the meat posteriorly, posterior laterally, is a little better. Um, I've had problems back there too, but I try to say, all right, if I just go posterior laterally and plate the fibula in the back, uh, I've kind of stayed away from that thin skin that's on the medial lateral sides. Okay. Um, I just want to do one more uh, audience response question. So how should this ankle fracture be fixed uh, or treated, better term, non-operatively in a cast, uh, formal ORF with plates and screws, percutaneous fixation, or even external fixation? Okay, about 13% went with non-operative management, and then there's a split between formal ORIF and percutaneous fixation. So I think we'll move on to what was done, and then uh, go from there. We're running low on time. Okay, Dr. Harding. So the power of this rush rod is unbelievable. 
and holding ankle fractures reduced without the need for external immobilization. I am constantly amazed at how well they stay together. And I have a pretty good series of them, and I have, I mean, I, I shouldn't say it, but right now at least, like, no fail, no massive failures. Now, you're not getting the same reduction, certainly rotationally, you're not getting the same control mm -hmm. as you would in a younger patient with, you know, formal ORIF. And in that younger patient, there's no way I would recommend this. I would say just wait till their skin is good enough and then do the more aggressive intervention. But this guy's skin was horrible always. His other leg was horrible. And so this was done through two percutaneous incisions, you know, literally a centimeter in size, and a, a manual reduction that maintained itself through the entire period of non-weight bearing, and then he ambulated um, with an x-ray that looked almost exactly like that by the end. Okay. So it's pretty amazing. My partner does them with uh, the same kind of percutaneous effort with um, a very long cannulated screw. Nice. And that's even a little better, I got to admit, because he showed me that one. Um, and it's better because the head is not as prominent as the tip of the rush rod. Good point. So I want to end with uh, some take-home points from that case and that uh, if you have compromised skin, percutaneous fixation uh, is definitely an option um, and you can always supplement with a cast or a splint. So with that, oh yes, Dr. Kazanjian. Yeah, I have to All beg right. for my rush rods to be restocked every time. Yeah, the, the comment that was made is that if you do not have access to rush rods, you could use a ball tip guide wire that you use for reaming or long cannulated screws, and we'll end with that. I'm getting the look. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Huh?